Good morning, everyone. Um, this is Andy Dwyer from Fight Colorectal Cancer with School of Public Health at University of, of Colorado um, this morning from Denver, uh, getting ready to start our webinar, um, the 2015 ASCO in review. So we'd like to, I'd like to send a special shout to the Fight CRC team um, that I work with, Kevin McAbee and um, Michael Sola, who are really helping with uh, making sure that our webinar goes uh, very smoothly this morning. So thank you to both for all of your, your help and work. I should say morning in Colorado and afternoon to those on the East Coast. Uh, next slide. So this morning I know we have about, uh, we have a number of people registered, so we're going to go ahead and get uh, started right on time. That way we make the most of the, um, make the most of our time this morning. So Dr. Dustin Deming will be our speaker and presenter. We're very excited to have Dusty, as he's affectionately known from our team as Fight CRC, as a person who is an expert in the medical field, um, as a physician himself, um, but also as a colorectal cancer survivor. We're really excited to have Dusty on. Um, so just a reminder this morning, or this afternoon, this morning, um, that we do have the arch archive webinars on a number of topics that Fight CRC does around patient education and support at our website. After the webinar, we'd ask that you complete a survey, and that one reminder that throughout the course of the webinar, we'd really love um, any questions in real time, um, uh, uh, real time information or any real time questions. If you could go ahead and have those typed out. Um, that we'll have that and we'll facilitate those questions at the end with Kevin leading that session. And of course, um, we will be uh, tweeting throughout the uh, duration of the presentation today. So a quick shout out um, that the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting um, it has a lot to do with research, of course, and that's what we're going to be presenting a, a lot about today, of course, around the science and what's uh, the latest information and really the most salient points. But part of what Fight CRC does is I really have a dedicated uh, mission towards research science and funding science. So we'd like to just mention the LISA fund where 100% um, of the funds are, late, are donated to late stage research um, looking at, uh, again, for, for late stage colorectal cancer uh, survivors and thinking about research in these domains. So as you can tell over the years we've definitely devoted more and more dollars um, towards our late stage research fund and we're really excited about continuing helping young investigators, particularly in the area, advancing their careers and advancing um, the science and hopefully finding cures as well as uh, good quality uh, treatments for, for cancer survivors. Next slide. So get involved. Um, just a reminder that One Million Strong, we're really continuing to promote uh, the One Million Strong movement uh, for One Million ca colorectal cancer survivors and that actually extends even to family members and support folks. But that um, One Million Strong is really about posting, liking, commenting, sharing, joining us on webinars, uh, being involved in Twitter, our advocacy um, research efforts, as well as um, utilizing the resources that Fight CRC provides for patients and their families. Next slide. So this morning, um, we're also going to be highlighting a few of the um, resources that have recently been added to the repertoire of what Fight Colorectal Cancer um, has available for patients and family members. Uh, we're excited that the uh, guide in the fight for, late, or for stage 3, stage 4 colorectal cancer survivors has been updated. Um, those of you who are interested in downloading this, it is on our website. Uh, at some point, we will be downloading updated uh, hard copy in print. But for anything, and for those of you who hold a current guide in the fight, we definitely have those available for download uh, where you can see any sort of updated um, information. And a lot of this, of course, is around new advances in science, different resources available, um, and then, of course, uh, making sure that the most timely information is included. We'd also like to, to talk a little bit about the podcast series that was launched in the last couple of months, um, Tabuti, which we will spend most of our time in these um, webinars really talking about provocative topics that are very pertinent to colorectal cancer survivors um, as well as their families. So uh, join us for uh, join us on our website um, to learn more about Tabuti and our podcast. We uh, currently have one that is um, uh, taped and downloaded that uh, discusses medicinal marijuana and the impact from a psychosocial as well as a clinical standpoint. And um, recently, or in the next couple of weeks, uh, well, actually I think recently we've uh, downloaded the, the piece around uh, palliative care. So these are two of the topics that we're currently addressing in our podcast series, but we'll have a number of new um, interesting topics to explore. Next slide. 
Just once um, again a reminder that Phycloerectal Cancer provides good patient education and support as much timely um, information and a critical review. However, this is in no way a supplement or replacement for your medical care. Uh, we ask that if any time that you have medical complications or conditions that you do speak with your clinical provider and team and of course in the um, in event that there's an emergency using 911. So with that, I would like to actually take a little bit of time uh, to actually welcome you um, and getting to know Dr. Dusty Deming. Um, at the last ASCO, so in 2014, uh, Dr. Deming and myself met at the Phycloretal Cancer Booth where he shared with me a little bit about his story and his interest in, his interest in becoming an advocate and working with the Fight CRC team. So over the last year, um, Dr. Deming has been featured in our Beyond Blue newsletter. We've kept in touch. Um, and really excited about all of the work that he's doing as he ha definitely has a strong research um, background in his own research, but also someone who's very dedicated to clinical care. And he's also a colorectal cancer survivor who was diagnosed at a very young age um, as a stage three rectal cancer. And then look, uh, really thinking about how this really works um, in terms of the balance between his professional as well as his uh, private experience with colorectal cancer makes him particularly someone who has firsthand knowledge and experience that really can help um, dedicate to understanding what the journey is like. And we're very, very excited to have uh, Dr. Deming, who is a GI oncologist at the University of uh, Wisconsin and the William S. Middleton Veterans Hospital. He's a, a subspecialty focus in the treatment of colon, rectal, and anal cancers. His research aims to fundamentally change the way in which we treat GI cancers and move to personalized approaches. Um, he's also worked in, therapy, uh, in targeted therapy research in the lab and active in early uh, clinical trials, developed the concept and shared several NCI CTEP sponsored phase one clinical trials, and he does sit on a number of very prestigious and established awards. I was just looking at his CV and looking at the number of young investigator awards that he has received. It's actually quite impressive. So we're very, very excited to have um, Dr. Deming join us. Um, next slide. Um, what I do also want to just say as he's getting ready to start our presentation is that we've actually asked Dr. Deming to join our medical advisory board and I'm very delighted that he has said yes and in the next week or two there will be more announcements about Dr. Deming and several other uh, professionals who join our medical advisory team. So Dusty, we are very, very thankful for all of your time, devotion and dedication to fight CRC um, and all the good work we're doing so I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that very uh, kind introduction and um, thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to, to present um, some of the exciting research that uh, was uh, presented at the ASCO annual um, meeting. Can you see my slides okay? Yes. Great. Uh, just uh, again a little bit about me. Um, before we get into the ASCO presentations. Um, again, I am a, a gastrointestinal oncologist at uh, the University of Wisconsin and um, I was diagnosed with uh, rectal cancer two weeks after starting uh, my faculty position here. So I had pretty much already dedicated my life to researching and um, treating colorectal cancer um, before my own uh, diagnosis. and. Um, as a patient, I underwent surgery, radiation, and, and chemotherapy, um, and through this process have learned a lot. I wouldn't wish a cancer diagnosis on anyone. Having been through it now, it's changed my life for the better in many ways. I no longer take life for granted. I understand when I have time with my family that that's really precious time. When I'm in the, the lab um, working on new treatments for colon cancer, I, I now understand that there's an urgency here. We need to get things done and we need to get things done now. And there's nothing more rewarding than spending my time in, in clinic with my patients, helping them go through the, the same diagnosis that I've had. Um, and along those same lines, I'm very grateful to be able to height uh, to help the, the fight um, CRC group um, and help patients um, with this disease or who've had this disease. So why is the, the ASCO annual meeting important? 
it's important for many reasons. It's it's a it's a huge meeting with um, over 30,000 oncology professionals there. Um, ASCO is the the nation's really leading clinical oncology um, society or group, and at this meeting is where um, the latest groundbreaking research um, across cancer types is, is presented. And there's many um, educational sessions, including uh, in addition to networking uh, platforms that are very important for developing the, the next generation of laboratory studies and clinical trials. So today I want to talk uh, about two kind of groups of advancements that were presented in colorectal cancer at the ASCO annual meeting. The one is, is looking at subtypes of, of colorectal cancer and developing therapies for different subtypes. Um, specifically the BRAF mutant subtype, the HER2 amplified subtype, and the mismare, or mismatch repair deficient group, and we'll, we'll talk in, in detail about what each of those groups are. And then in addition, we'll talk about some of the survivorship care issues that, um, and the recent evidence that was discussed at the ESCO annual meeting. So the, the more we, we study colon cancer, the more we're learning that it's actually um, a group of many different diseases. It's not just one disease that we're treating. There's multiple different subtypes. And we think a big reason for that, these different subtypes is, is that as tumors start up from normal tissue and progress to cancers, they develop different abnormalities in their DNA that we call mutations. Above, on the top here, we've listed some of the important mutations that are acquired with time um, as tumors progress from early polyps to cancers. And it's this um, molecular profile or the, the different mutations that these uh, cancers acquire over time that lead to these different subtypes of cancer. Because of these subtypes, we understand that when patients uh, present to the clinic with uh, colon cancer, they're, are, they're all different. And that's one of the very frustrating things about um, seeing patients in clinic is that as of right now, when people present, we treat them in generally the same way with the same type of, of chemotherapy, even though that we, we do know that the biology of some of their cancers is different. So what our hope is, is that we can actually divide up the colorectal cancers into different subtypes and develop optimal therapies for these individual subtypes and use laboratory tests or new imaging studies to help, uh, one, predict how people are going to do with these new therapies, and then also help educate us on what the, the next best therapy could be. To understand these subtypes, we need to understand a little bit about the, the biology of um, colon cancer. And so I have a, a picture of a, a cell here, and it's, it's a very simplified picture, but it's, it's important for our discussion today. And there's two uh, major cellular pathways that are important for um, colon cancer. And so the blue area here is the outside of the cell, the cell membrane, and on the surface of the membrane is multiple proteins. And these proteins are um, growth factor receptors that receive signals from outside in the body telling the cell to grow. And when they receive these signals, they pass the signals along multiple different proteins throughout the cell. And so here's an example of the, the RAS pathway. So downstream of the EGFR growth factor, these signals pass through these different proteins to the nucleus where the cell gets the signal, grow, 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 divide, divide, divide. Multiple of these pathways can be abnormal in colon cancer cells. And now that we're learning more about the biology of colon cancer, we're learning that, well, maybe we can interfere with some of these signals. And interfering with these signals has led to um, exciting advances for colon cancer. And that's, that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today with the, the first group of, of clinical trials. Prior to, to this year's um, ASCO, we really have just been analyzing colon cancers for three abnormalities or three mutations, KRAS, NRAS, and BRAF. Those have previously been shown to be important because they lead to resistance to 
uh, chemotherapies for colon cancer, specifically cetuximab and panitimumab. So if a patient presents to the clinic and has metastatic uh, colorectal cancer, we should test their cancer for these um, three mutations. And if those mutations are detected, then we don't give cetuximab and panitimumab. The major reason for that is that the patients aren't going to respond. Their, their tumors will not shrink or, or benefit from those treatments, but they'll still get all of the side effects. So it's been a, a great advance for us to actually have these tests that help predict resistance to these agents. But what we've been lacking is actually markers that tell us well, what drugs will people respond to? And so the first study that I'd like to talk about is looking at um, BRAF. So if we go back to our cell diagram, between the EGFR um, protein on the surface of the cell and the nucleus, um, downstream of RAS, so RAS is the one of the proteins that um, we've been already um, profiling, so KRAS and NRAS, which are two different types of RAS, those have shown that if they're activated, we get a signaling down this pathway, even if we try to use drugs that target up here at the surface. So it makes sense in that setting that this pathway, if it's activated below this receptor, targeting that receptor is not going to be helpful. And that's a similar thing for RAS, so here in BRAS. And so in this first study, what the investigators have aimed to do was look at, well, why don't we target at the EGFR protein on the surface of the cell with cetuximab and then also target this RAF um, protein with a drug called vemurafenib. And we can do that in combination with a standard chemotherapy, aranotecan. And so that's what this study did. It looked at the BRAF mutant subtype of colon cancer, which is about 10% of colon cancer, and it tends to be a very aggressive form of colon cancer. Um, this is one of the um, prognostic markers uh, that uh, predicts for, um, unfortunately, a pretty poor survival. And so it's very important that we develop additional therapies to help for this subtype of colon cancer. In general, this regimen was pretty well tolerated. Um, there were um, a fair amount of side effects, though, with fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, and rash. Excitingly, though, um, in this very early phase clinical trial, um, six out of 17 patients developed a, a partial response. And so there is a great promise for this um, combination going forward, and this um, combination is currently part of a, a cooperative tri uh, group trial um, looking at this um, this regimen. So that's a, a study that's ongoing um, in the U.S. right now, and, and we're really excited about this preliminary data and what it might mean for this um, subgroup of patients. The next study that I wanted to talk about is looking at HER2 amplification. So if we go back to our uh, cell diagram, you can see one of the growth factors here on the surface of, of the cell is HER2. And similar to EGFR, when there's a lot of HER2 on the surface, this tells the cancer cells through the, the signaling in the cell to grow, 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 divide, 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 um, basically act like a cancer cell. And so the investigators who um, ran this clinical trial were trying to determine if we target outside the, the cell with trastuzumab at HER2 and inside the cell both, with uh, lapatinib. Lapatinib is a, a drug that works inside the cell at um, HER2, but also at EGFR at the same time. And excitingly, with this combination, they were able to demonstrate um, significant responses. Uh, so 34% um, percent of patients had a, a partial response, and, and a partial response means that they had at least a 30% reduction in the, um, the diameter of their tumors which is um, a, a, a pretty exciting finding. This is especially exciting because in this study, these patients had already progressed on um, the typical standard chemotherapy regimens. This again, though, is a small subtype of colon cancer. Only about 5% um, of colon cancers have um, uh, HER2 amplification. And uh, clini further clinical trials are currently in um, development, though I'm not aware of any ongoing clinical trials uh, in the U.S. at this time. Uh, 
the next set of data I want to talk about is a, a very exciting uh, additional subtype of, of colon cancer. And this actually made a, a very big impact at um, ASCO as this study uh, for the first time demonstrated a potential benefit for using immune-based therapies for the treatment of colon cancer. And this looks specifically at the mismatch repair de deficient population. So mismatch repair is um, a way that the cells work to repair damage that's been, been done to the DNA. And this is uh, mutated in about 15% of colorectal cancers. MLH1 and MSH2 are the most common genes that are uh, mutated um, causing this. And in early stage um, cancers, so stage two, stage one, stage two, and stage three cancers, mismatch repair deficiency actually results in improved prognosis. So these patients tend to do better than um, if they are uh, mismatch uh, repair proficient. Um, interestingly, there's also um, some uh, decreased responsiveness to one of our typical chemotherapy agents, 5-fluorouracil uh, or 5-FU. One of the ways that we test to see if um, this mismatch repair or this DNA damage repair system is um, abnormal in the, the cancers is to look at microsatellite instability, which is looking at specialized regions of the DNA and, and seeing if there are abnormalities um, in, these, in the DNA there. If uh, mismatch repair genes are mutated, that, re that actually results in these cancers developing hundreds to thousands of mutations. And as you can imagine, if there's a lot of abnormalities in the cell, it's very possible that those cells will end up looking different when your immune um, system is um, helping to try to keep control of cancers or help prevent cancers from forming. And so that may be one of the reasons why the mismatch repair um, deficient um, cancers actually, those patients with those cancers do better. What the investigators looked at was, well, in the, in the metastatic setting, there's about 5% of colon cancer patients who have um, this mismatch repair deficiency. And if these cancers have all of these mutations are, and are presenting um, all these abnormal um, proteins to the um, immune system, maybe we can do some treatments to actually um, help initiate the immune system to target these cancers. And the exciting thing is that we've already been testing for um, mismatch repair deficiency. Um, and at many cancer centers, including uh, our cancer center here, we routinely do this for all patients with colon cancer. And so um, what this study did was looked at the um, anti-PD-1 uh, therapy, pembrolizumab, and it treated patients with mismatch repair deficient tumors. Now this is a, a pretty small study, but they had um, a pretty exciting finding. So after uh, 12 weeks of treatment, 40% of the patients had a, a, a partial response, or again, 30%, at least 30% reduction in their tumors. And about 90% of the patients had um, at least stable disease, if not better, at that 12-week mark. Um, so this is, again, a very exciting therapy. These therapies tend to be very well tolerated. Um, and this is, again, the first time that immune-based therapies have actually shown um, benefit for colon cancer. They did include a population of patients that didn't have mismatch repair deficiency in this study. Unfortunately, none of those patients developed um, a response. So there's a, um, a lot of uh, interest in one looking further at this mismatch repair deficient um, group in further clinical trials. There are um, clinical trials underway in the U.S. currently in addition to multiple clinical trials um, being um, planned right now. But a, another active area of research for this is, is looking at, well, how do we make mismatch repair proficient tumors, or ones that don't have these um, mutations in MLH1 or MSH2, how can we make those cancers um, more easily detected by the immune system? And are there things that we can combine with pembrolizumab to, to accomplish those goals? So this is something that we've 
kind of only um, seen kind of the tip of the iceberg on and um, and very excited about uh, possibilities of that moving forward. Uh, one of the, the possibilities is that maybe we can use um, radiation treatments or other targeted therapies in combination with pembrolizumab to, um, or other anti-PD-1 therapies to sensitize um, colon cancers that don't have this uh, mismatch repair deficiency. So, so why is this important? Well, I think these studies, though none of them is definitive yet, none of them has changed the standard of care to date, they're showing me a lot of hope. They're showing me that we're getting better. We're understanding the biology of the cancers, and as we understand the biology, we're able to take advantage of that biology. I think th these initial subgroups that we're seeing now are just the initial subgroups. I think there's going to be a, a lot of exciting research over the um, uh, next few years looking at different subtypes of colon cancer and uh, developing personalized treatment strategies for those cancer. This re research, though, comes with a lot of questions and uncertainties as well. When we're trying to identify these subgroups, who should we test? How should that testing be done? When should this testing be done? Um, which mutations or abnormalities in the cells are important? It, it's often that um, colon cancer has as many as 90 or so mutations, even without those mismatch uh, repair abnormalities. Which of those mutations are the important ones? And then how does this all get paid for? So there is a lot of concern about how much um, oncology tests and uh, oncology drugs cost uh, right now, and we're trying to figure out how we can uh, do these things in, in, cost effective, uh, in a cost-effective manner. In my clinic, we're, we're, when we're interested in looking for subtypes of colon cancer, we are performing um, different mutation profiles and, and trying to get patients into clinical trials that uh, help um, match their cancer with certain subtypes. Unfortunately, right now, what we know about subtypes and, and the clinical, clinical trials that we have, it's, it's only a minority of patients whose tumors actually have um, mutations that match a clinical trial. But I think the, the more we learn, um, the, the greater the chance for, for different opportunities like this. One of the, the opportunities that I think is a, a great option for, for patients, um, which was announced at ASCO, um, is the um, initiation of the NCI MATCH trial. So this is a National Cancer Institute um, study in which um, patients have biopsies that are paid for by the trial. The biopsies then have um, a full profiling done on them, uh, which is also paid for by the clinical trial. And then this trial has multiple groups of treatments. Those multiple um, groups of treatments are based on what abnormalities are found um, when the profiling is done. And so, for instance, if someone has a, a PIK3CA mutation found when their uh, tumor is biopsied, then on that study, they would go into the PIK3CA mutant group and be treated with a drug that was specifically designed for um, that particular mutation. Um, so this is a, a great um, possible uh, clinical trial uh, option for, for patients in the, the future. Um, and this is just getting started um, in many uh, cancer centers across the, the U.S. Next, I want to talk about survivorship care. Uh, there were two um, studies, one regarding aspirin and one regarding vitamin D, um, that I think are a, a great advance for uh, patients with, with colon cancer. Um, the first looked at aspirin, and it looked at a, a cohort of um, over 25,000 patients from Norway, and it looked at um, mostly stage two and stage three uh, colorectal cancer patients, and it examined whether or not they were using aspirin and their survival after diagnosis. Um, it's exciting to, to say that there was a significant um, improvement in both colon 
colon cancer survival, but also overall survival for these patients. Um, and the, the dose of, of aspirin ranged from 81 to 325 milligrams um, in, in these studies. So a, a very simple um, intervention that is um, improving patient survival um, after a diagnosis of, of colon cancer. And it's, it's also important for um, heart disease and prevention of stroke as well. As far as um, vitamin D, I know Dr. Benson um, on the GI ASCO webinar uh, discussed some of the data um, that was presented there. Here there was an uh, update of the um, CALGB SWOG 80405 study which looked at vitamin D um, status in patients who are undergoing first-line therapy for metastatic colon cancer. And metastatic uh, colon cancer patients are often found to have low vitamin D levels. Um, that's especially true for people in the north and northeast, um, especially in the winter and spring months, um, because exposure to sunlight um, is important for vitamin D. In addition, um, obese and less active patients are also more likely to have lower vitamin D, vitamin D levels, and uh, those not taking supplementation obviously have lower levels. In this study, uh, what was found was that the patients who had a lower vitamin D um, level didn't live as long as those who had higher vitamin D levels. And this, um, in this analysis, they tried to control for many of the um, things that could uh, potentially also um, alter this uh, vitamin D level, and after all of their controlling in the study, what they, what they found was that vitamin D level was still very important. What we don't know, though, is does supplementation help? Um, we know that, pay, that from these studies that vitamin D, um, when it's low at diagnosis, um, predicts for um, worse outcomes, but we're not sure if then um, supplementing with vitamin D makes a difference. And so there are uh, clinical trials that are actively accruing now looking at um, whether supplementation with vitamin D will improve survival for patients with um, both um, locally resected but also um, metastatic uh, colorectal cancer as well. And so what do I tell my patients and, and what do I do myself? Uh, well, the good news is, is that the things that we know that are important for colorectal cancer prevention are good for people's health in general. Um, uh, I recommend a, a daily aspirin. 81 milligrams to 325 milligrams. We don't know that 325 is better than 81. Um, I take 325 uh, just because, um, in addition to my pentoprazole to help with my, um, my, my stomach as well and help prevent complications from the aspirin. Um, we also recommend um, daily exercise. There's a lot of evidence that um, activity is important, important in preventing um, colorectal cancer, um, both um, initiation but also recurrence. And um, we recommend at least 30 uh, minutes three times per week. And what I tell my patients is that I don't want it to be um, just going for a walk unless you're, um, when you go for a walk, that's actually getting your heart pumping, get, getting you a, a little bit on the sweaty side. So we're, we're really looking for um, a cardiovascular um, workout um, to improve um, um, CRC prevention. In addition, I recommend a, a low glycemic index diet. Uh, if you Google low glycemic index diet, they can get pretty um, complex. What I tell my patients and what I follow in general is that we know that foods that are high in simple sugars raise the blood sugars fast. And we think that it's probably those peaks in the blood sugar that are um, the worst as far as um, colon, uh, colon cancer recurrence. And so um, when able, I tell patients to try to avoid um, sugary dessert type foods, high fructose um, corn syrup, um, and when you're going to eat carbohydrates, to eat carbohydrates that are more complex, so whole wheat, multi-grain type um, carbohydrates. And then, you know, with this question of vitamin D, what should we do? Well, in general, I 
I talk to patients about taking a multivitamin if they want. Um, I do check um, vitamin D levels on my patients. Um, you know, living in, in Wisconsin, we often have um, our patients low in vitamin D, and so I do replace their vitamin D. In patients with a, a normal vitamin D, should we um, c continue supplementation? Well, I don't, th I don't think we know that. Um, though I, I do think that uh, the majority of my patients end up um, taking a, a, a multivitamin with low-dose vitamin D. I do not recommend high doses of vitamin D. Um, there's actually some um, preclinical modeling where very, very high doses of vitamin D actually um, in a mouse model caused um, more tumors than less tumors. And so I, I think we can um, potentially do harm with too high doses of vitamin D, um, but something that uh, obviously needs to be studied further. So kind of uh, in summary and in, in looking at future directions, I'm, I'm really excited about the, um, the, the data that's looking at the subtypes of, of colon cancer. And I think, again, this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, multiple confirmatory studies will uh, be ongoing looking at these different um, subtypes of colon cancer. Um, a particular subtype that I'm interested in is this PIK3CA mutant subtype. And so in, in my laboratory, what we've um, done is we've actually been able to grow um, human cancer cells in um, a 3D um, gel, kind of like a, it's kind of like fruit in a jello mold. And when we grow cells in this, this jelly-like substance, we can actually grow um, colon cancer cells that wouldn't otherwise be able to be grown. And so we're able to look at some of these um, more rare subtypes that weren't able to be grown before, and we can grow them as these, these little spheres. And these little spheres with time will develop um, little projections coming off of them that actually look like um, crypts in the colon. So they're trying to, um, to make a colon in, our, in our, our dish. And what we found is that when this PIK3CA mutation is present in the, these um, cells, as long as it doesn't also have a, a KRAS or BRAF or NRAS mutation, these cancer cells are very sensitive to um, these drugs called PI3 kinase and mTOR inhibitors. And so we currently have uh, two clinical trials in development based on our laboratory research um, trying to look at this uh, particular subtype of colon cancer as well. And so I think the, the more and more we're understanding the biology of colon cancer, the more these subtypes are going to come up. And so it, it, it Right now, it seems that some of these subtypes are pretty rare, but as we're adding up more and more of these subtypes, it's becoming a, a bigger and bigger population. And that's all I had, and happy to uh, open things up for uh, questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Deming. I will go ahead and um, ask a few questions. Um, if it's okay, we can just leave this slide up right here, if that works for you. Perfect. Um, so we did have a lot of questions come in, um, and just I'll start out with one clarifying question. Um, someone just had asked um, if you could repeat what it was that helps with the side effects of a daily aspirin. So, so one of the side effects that um, comes with taking a daily aspirin is a lot of acid in the stomach and the risk of um, gastritis or inflammation in the stomach or even ulcers with prolonged aspirin use. And so um, many um, people use um, medications like pantoprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor, um, which are available over the counter or by prescription, which help um, decrease the acid in the stomach. That, that, that allows um, for less heartburn when uh, people are taking aspirin. Great. And then Related to that, um, what would you consider to be a high dose of vitamin D? So there are, so the, the typical um, vitamin D that's in a, a multivitamin is somewhere around 400 to 800 international units of, of vitamin D. When we're trying to um, raise somebody's vitamin D level, sometimes we will go um, as high as um, 4,000 or 8,000 um, 
international units of uh, vitamin D, and that's the, the D3 form. <coughs> Excuse me. There are some ways in which you can raise vitamin D where people are giving as high doses of 50,000 units. And so um, unless somebody is having trouble with a low vitamin D level, I wouldn't recommend um, taking more than 4,000 um, units a day for sure. Um, and most of my patients who have a normal vitamin D level, were, were, they're on the four to 800 international units a day. Okay, great. And then a low level, um, does that vary by patient or is that um, kind of a standard level is considered normal? So, so it, it, it depends kind of where people are and their institutional standards. Um, it also, the exact, the, what, is, what, what is exactly a low number isn't necessarily perfectly defined. Um, people use um, level somewhere um, in the kind of 15 to 20 range as um, more normal levels. Um, clearly numbers over 30, at least on, on our um, scale here, are uh, very normal. Okay. Some, some of my patients will present to clinic and their vitamin D levels um, will, will be undetectable. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of interested um, questions, you know, around sort of this uh, recurrence prevention and that sort of thing. And so thank you for clarifying those. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions um, now kind of around the clinical trials and the, the studies. Um, so we do have one question on, um, is there typically a certain age that, you know, these types of clinical trials that were presented at ASCO, are these treatments for a certain age group um, over or under a certain age? Is there a cutoff in either direction? So the, the, the vast majority of these clinical trials um, require um, patients to be at least 18 years of age. Uh, typically there is not a upper limit though. Okay. And then do you um, have any comments on like how far off you think some of these studies and therapies are from being um, FDA approved or, you know, considered a part of standard of care? I think at this time probably the, the BRAF um, study is the, the closest um, to FDA approval because that study has been ongoing um, for quite a while. Um, though it also wouldn't be surprising to me with um, in the next um, couple years as we learn more about the mismatch repair deficient group that um, um, pembrolizumab or one of the other anti-PD-1 therapies um, would get an accelerated FDA approval because of how exciting the preliminary data is. And so I, so I think um, it's potential that even within, you know, two to three years that we'll be talking about FDA approval of some of these um, options. Great. So as far as getting access to these clinical trials, and you mentioned the NCI um, MATCH trial, um, you know, for that trial, um, even specifically, or for other clinical trials so that people would have access to some of these new therapies, what questions should people be asking their doctor um, about sort of these trials? Are there specific questions, or should they just bring in, you know, sort of the information about a specific trial to ask their doctor about it? So I, I think it's important right now that that people start thinking about, and we don't know the right answer yet, but I think that people start talking and thinking about the, the subtyping of colorectal cancer, cancers. Uh, for my patients in clinic, I'm attempting to get um, a full mutation profile on the, the vast majority of my patients who present to the clinic. Um, now that right now is kind of ahead of the curve and many insurances won't pay for it at this point. Um, but it's, it's now becoming that when we're testing for KRAS, BRAF, NRAS, and then also um, some of the mismatch repair genes as standard of care, that it, when you test for that number of things, it actually becomes cheaper to do the full panel. And when we do the full panel, 
that allows us opportunities to look for um, clinical trials that are targeting different subtypes. Because it might be that the clinical trial that we find that's interesting for a particular patient might actually not be a clinical trial that, that we're, we would be thinking about. It may not be a clinical trial that was designed specifically um, for colon cancer patients, as many clinical trials now are um, trying to develop therapies for different subtypes of cancer. And some of these um, subtypes or some of these mutations are, are common in other cancer types as well. And so it might be that patients can get into clinical trials um, based on um, some of the findings from their tumor in clinical trials that weren't necessarily at least originally designed for colon cancer. So related to that, um, you know, are patients, um, are you finding that patients are being routinely tested for these subtypes and mutations like um, the mismatch repair deficiency or HER2 or BRAF? Um, and if a patient has not currently been tested, is that something that they need to be asking their doctor about? At our cancer center, we're testing everyone for um, mismatch repair deficiency. We do the testing here um, based on staining of the, the cancer on slides. Okay. The, so that is, that's done for everyone. Given the exciting um, findings that we're seeing um, with these anti-PD-1 therapies, I would recommend that patients, if they don't know if they're mismatch repair deficient or not, and they have um, metastatic colon cancer, that that information be found because I think that is a, a real option for patients. Now, not that that should be, um, should replace the standard of care therapies, but it should be something that's considered, um, if not um, at this time, down the road. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I think there's, you know, a lot of questions on making sure that, um, you know, patients are getting, you know, routine care, but also that the tests that they're receiving will help them, you know, with their treatment plans. Um, so we do have a couple of questions about some other um, data that was shared at ASCO that um, you didn't cover in your presentation. So, um, you know, if you don't have any information about this, we can certainly um, post something after the fact. But um, one person did have a question on um, what you thought of the data presented about the liver metastases microspheres data. Um, so if you want to answer that, or we can certainly follow up after the webinar with more information. And I'm happy to, to answer that. Um, so the, the Searflux clinical trial was a, a very interesting clinical trial. And what they did in that study was look at um, radioembolization of, of spheres in combination with first-line chemotherapy for uh, patients with liver-predominant disease, colon cancer, metastatic colon cancer, um, meaning that the most of their cancer was in their liver, but the patients in that study could have had spots of cancer outside the liver. So they could have cancer in lymph nodes um, up to a certain size and could also have um, cancer in the lungs um, up to a certain number and, and size. And what was found in that study is that when we did the, or when they did the radioembolization in combination with the chemotherapy, it helped prevent the cancer from growing in the liver. What it didn't do was help, um, and not surprisingly, it didn't help prevent the spots of cancer from growing outside the liver um, in the lungs, lymph nodes, or other areas. And so when they looked at the whole population, it didn't improve patient survival, um, and it didn't improve progression or the time to progression for those patients except for um, specifically in the liver itself. And so I think there is a likely patient population where it makes sense for us to think of doing um, radioembolizations early on, um, but exactly who that population is, it's, it's not exactly clear at this point, and it's something that I think needs to be investigated further. Um, I think the waiting until um, late line therapy to do radioembolization doesn't seem to result in the, the same benefit that we're seeing when it's done in the early line setting, like in this clinical trial. 
Um, so it's something that I think clearly deserves um, more uh, investigation in the future. Thank you. Um, yeah, I know that there's been a lot of a lot of discussion about that. Um, the data that was presented there on that. Um, so, you know, are there any other um, topics that patients should be considering? I don't know if any additional data was presented about this at ASCO, but sort of um, genetic testing for family members. Um, is there anything um, else, you know, as far as the, the subtypes of tumor data that would influence genetic testing for family members where CRC is prevalent? So the, the mutational profiling or the subtypes that I have mostly been talking about are separate than um, familial um, syndromes or hereditary syndromes, um, at least to some extent. The mismatch repair deficient group, um, that's a, a similar group to those patients that um, have Lynch, Lynch syndrome. Um, so um, patients with Lynch syndrome who develop metastatic colon cancer, this um, data with pembrolizumab is um, very applicable to that group. As far as who to consider um, for genetic testing regarding um, colon cancer syndromes, it, in my clinic, um, I routinely um, have patients under age of 60 um, talk to our genetic counselors or patients who um, have more than one um, or have an additional family member with uh, a, a colon cancer. Um, we're getting a lot better at detecting some of these um, colorectal cancer um, mutation um, syndromes. Uh, our testing has definitely improved over the last five years. And so I think that is, is a very important part um, of the treatment of colorectal cancer. Um, for instance, um, when we're thinking about surgical options for cancer, if we know there's a, uh, an underlying genetic syndrome that would predispose to um, future cancers forming, it's, it's important for us to make sure that we're doing the right surgery. And so if taking the whole colon out um, makes sense because of the, the risk of future cancers, um, it's very important that we know that information um, as soon as possible and so patients don't under, end up undergoing multiple surgeries. Thank you for clarifying that. And I think it is important to um, distinguish between, you know, the, the testing that you would have if you're a colorectal cancer patient and testing the tumors versus the genetic testing of inherited syndrome. So thank you for that. Um, so we did have a question come in, um, taking us back to the um, the MMR deficiency, um, that being a pretty rare mutation. Do you know if there's anything else on the horizon um, that might be more broadly applicable um, as far as colorectal cancer since that is a small population? So the that small population um, is going to be the, probably the, the, the focus of most clinical trials going on um, um, currently or in the near future. There is some ideas about combining um, the anti-PD-1 therapies with radiation, and I know there are clinical trials that are in development. Um, I'm not certain if there's any um, I'm not sure if there is any um, ongoing clinical trials for that, that population right now. Great. Um, so we did want to just ask, is there any um, information or data that was presented to ASCO that kind of crosses all cancers? Um, because it is, you know, obviously a, a conference that, you know, isn't just focused on colorectal cancer specifically. Um, is there any data that's connected to um, other cancers that has impact for colorectal cancer? Any other, um, you know, studies that you think that we should, should take a look at? So I think the from a, a therapeutic standpoint, the, the immunotherapies are really um, what seems to be crossing um, many different disease types. So the, the anti-PD-1 therapies um, have significant benefit for many cancer types. 
um, especially squamous cell um, cancers. As far as um, other studies that, that seem to be branching um, across disease types, I think um, some important things are um, how diabetes affects cancer and that um, patients with uncontrolled diabetes seem to do worse um, for, for many reasons um, uh, across many different cancer types. And in addition, um, you know, the, the better diets we have, um, the more exercise we do, and the um, decreased prevalence of smoking are also important across um, all cancer types. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your time and I just want to end with one last question and then I'll let you summarize with any final thoughts that you have. Um, so I know that you mentioned this in your discussion and we talk a lot about this at Fight Colorectal Cancer about, you know, how do we have that sense of hope? We're seeing new data come out um, that is exciting um, and I think a lot of people for a while have been kind of questioning why are there so many new drugs in these other areas um, and feel there may be little momentum in colorectal cancer, but I think that the research that you've presented here, um, you know, it is exciting, it is hopeful, and so just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that and, and let you close after after that. So I think that that's really um, what was motivating at, at ASCO this year is that for really the, the first time in a number of years, we're seeing kind of a, a head of steam coming for colon cancer. We're seeing that all of the, the work that's been done over the last five years to try to do this, this subtyping is starting to pay off. We're starting to see um, these groups emerge where we're getting benefits from our, from our therapies. Um, for a long time, we weren't looking at the mutation profiles and we were um, non-specifically um, providing um, chemotherapies in the hopes of killing every cell that was dividing. And we know when we do those types of approaches, yes, they help some people, but they also hurt a lot of people. Uh, with these new targeted therapies in general, they're much better tolerated. And as we become better at identifying who's going to benefit from them, um, I'm just really excited about what we're going to see. I think there, there's going to be a lot of advances in the, the very near future looking at the, these particular subtypes. And then, you know, building on that, um, finding ways in which we can use the immune system to target these cancers is also um, a new exciting approach that we've never been able to um, utilize for, for colon cancer ever before. Thank you so much, Dr. Deming, for taking the time to speak with us today. We really appreciate your perspective as a medical professional and as a patient, and I think you've really provided a lot of valuable insight for us. So I just want to Thank you so much for today, and um, we will go ahead and close the webinar. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. I'm very honored that uh, I was asked to do this. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.